Hi, Mike. Hey, Carolyn. We're back in our home offices after attending MNVC, the Musculoskeletal New Ventures Conference, which was presented by Health Point Capital uh, in Memphis earlier this week. And it was a great event with 40 startups pitching their technologies and investors sharing their expertise. Ortho World was honored to be a sponsor this year. And I think you and I both walked away with just a greater understanding of how companies are really innovating in the orthopedic space, especially there were a lot of spine companies and sports medicine companies who were really talking about decreasing uh, failure rates when it comes to spinal fusions and tendon and ligament repairs and so forth. So it was a really great conference. What are maybe some of the takeaways that you brought back? Yeah, uh, two points that I wanted to make, but I wanted to sort of contextualize it in the greater sort of framework of advice that we heard investors offering to those who are, who are here. Uh, Health Point Capital said that they went back over the last seven years and measured all of the pitches that they had seen, all the slide decks that they've seen, and not one company came within 40% of their revenue projections. So we often see these enormous multi-billion dollar TAMs in these slide decks, and then a really quick ramp to 50 million, 100 million in revenue. So the advice that investors were giving to folks is really be thoughtful about those projections, but also instead of maybe rushing to commercialization, there's two ways that you can really differentiate your company and make it valuable to the strategics who might eventually purchase your company. Number one is invest in clinical evidence. In orthopedics at least, highly commoditized, not many products with really, really strong clinical evidence. So if you're able to bring in that type of evidence to a company, to a strategic who might lack the risk tolerance or the patience to develop that body of evidence, that could be a, a really strong, um, really, really strong value creator for you. Also, when you think about where you're going to spend your money, instead of maybe on a really expensive commercial organization, you should first look to high quality regulatory and IP advice. Those are two really trippy, tricky uh, areas that can get a company into sort of a doom loop of back and forth and wasted time and effort. Um, and, and it's one of the ways that if you're smart up front, you can really smooth your path to an exit as a company. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, you know, I would add that the last panel discussion we heard was on today's regulatory environment. And for years, we've been hearing, we've been writing about how the European Union's more restrictive medical device regulation, MDR, would really kill innovation and hinder um, the market opportunity for startups and small companies in Europe. And while MDR is still being implemented, we absolutely have seen orthopedic companies prioritize the U.S. market. And, you know, even at MNVC, the companies that were pitching and that were featured, quite a few of them are were founded and headquartered in Europe and Israel, Australia, and they're really focusing on the U.S. market first. That was you know, one of the pieces of advice that we heard from multiple regulatory, a notified body and regulatory consultants who were speaking at MNVC. I mean, it, you know, it does make sense, right? The U.S. market, we estimate it to be 67% of global orthopedic sales. So it is a, a significant market. Um, but it will be interesting to see how that plays out over the next few years as companies really prioritize the U.S. market over maybe Europe or, or another market. For sure. Yeah. And then the other thing that that panel brought up was, was biocompatibility. It is just an increasingly important topic or issue that we are seeing globally, but especially with FDA. And, you know, we have written about this topic uh, for several years now. There's a lot of confusion just around testing protocols, material data, materials data that needs to be collected and best practices. So we will link to those articles in the description of this video if you're seeking, you know, 
greater advice on that topic. And then one of the sort of the mic drop at the end of that panel was that the new, you know, biocompatibility focus will become cybersecurity. That's going to be the greatest focus for regulators moving forward, which makes a lot of sense as more enabling technology companies enter the market. Um, but, you know, something for anybody to consider if they're going to have a connected device, you can expect just greater scrutiny from regulatory bodies as you're seeking to get to market. Yep, absolutely. So why don't we move on to maybe some of the companies that stood out to us? As we mentioned earlier, there were 40 presenting companies. So it is hard to maybe just narrow down to a few of them. But I mean, who who, who did you find of interest? So really for me, the first one was Osteo. Uh, they have a proprietary, really innovative way to treat joint infections. And when when you see the the data on the deadliness of these infections it's cancer like mortality rates i think um you know in some cases more deadly than breast cancer so the other side of that as well is for the patient population these are affecting once they these patients lose mobility over a significant number of weeks that really ramps up the mortality rates as well so it's a massive problem um, but not many good options right now so osteo has a really exciting um, delivery method and drug combination that they believe can really change the standard of care for these joint infections. Mm -hmm. The other one for me, again, this would be a, a game-changing technology if we see it pan out, but Vizi, their promise is that they can have optical tracking and navigation that is pinless for robotic surgery. One of the, the big um, problems with current robotic surgery in orthopedics is that it's sort of a pain to do and it's very finicky. We see that that's one of the major reasons adoption for robotics within orthopedics is very low relative some, to some of the other areas of med tech. So if Vizzy's technology pans out, it would be a game changer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think every company with a robot would have to switch to this type of technology because surgeons aren't going to want to go back to using the pin arrays and, and the really rudimentary methods that are in use today. Mm. And I would just have to say, just from some of the folks who approached Vizzy after their presentation, it caught the attention of some of the major players for sure. Well, so it sort of sounds like it, this is the next generation, right? The next generation. Of it could be. Yeah. It was, it was an impressive demonstration and an impressive pitch. Um, I, I hope to see it pan out because I think, it would be beneficial to everyone involved if more technology uh, utilization came into orthopedics. Awesome. Sort of in the same vein as is infections, I would say to me, Resolute, they, they stood out. They received a lot of questions and interest from the audience. They are developing a one-stage solution for orthopedic trauma infections. Their first indication will be tibial fractures and you know, their their founder and CEO, Cambry Kelly, really said that there's just no consistency or, you know, state of art method for how to prevent infections from happening in in these severe trauma cases. So what they're developing is a nail that has an antibiotic core and the antibiotics we essentially um, elude over a four week period. It's a combination product as well. So it will require an IDE. It's likely that we won't see that on the market for several years, but you know, certainly, you know, we, we know that infections are a huge, a huge issue in orthopedics. And as you mentioned, can be deadly really, uh, then they also lead to revisions and just a problem that a lot of companies are trying to tackle in orthopedics. Yeah. The second company that I was impressed with was Askel Healthcare. They're a Finnish company that is targeting cartilage lesions. So they brought together orthopedic, cell, and materials expertise to develop their Coppola technology. So uh, the Coppola implant is a very simple sheet made of collagen and PLA that assists with cartilage regeneration. 
But I think the thing that was really impressive is that this implant allows for load bearing much sooner than than competitors on the market. So it looked like it's absolutely solving, you know, a problem. There's their first indication is um, knee cartilage lesions, but they are just speeding up the recovery so much faster than their competitors. This also is a long-term, uh, a long-term product because they are on their on a PMA pathway. So it's likely that it wouldn't see market until 2030. But just the early data looks really, really interesting. And again, they they received a lot of really great questions from from the individuals in the audience. Yeah, almost impossible to pick just two companies right after yeah. seeing so many presentations, so many companies with technologies that are across the spectrum of everything from stitching all the way up to to trauma robots to, to new ways to do navigation uh infection control uh, all across the spectrum so really exciting times in, in orthopedics absolutely any other takeaways no i mean just uh you know as 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 you know one of my favorite meetings of the year really gives you a great peek into you know what strategics are looking for and what the future of orthopedics is you sort of get the roadmap for the next couple of years in orthopedics going to this meeting. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay up to date on more videos. And you can find more coverage from MNVC at orthoworld.com. Thank you for watching. Thanks.